I missed this before. Wow, it's like a... I missed the smell. Hmm. Ecosystem Services. It is an ecological asset to all tourism based enterprise. This includes exotic destinations, resorts, adventure tours on land and in the sea. The environment that provides calmness and refuge for those on vacation. Also provides livelihood to many. Despite its immense economic value, it is often the most neglected aspect of every business. This ecosystem services are provided by nature to our prosperity for free. But it is not limitless. It can degrade. When it degrades, the businesses will also degrade along with it. By presenting these views of environmental economics to you, we at Ocean Quest Global hope that you will be able to use it for the benefits of your business and for sustainability. The excitement you saw in our video are example of what nature has provided to you. It is now your time to help it thrive again. Many aspects of environmental economics have always presented in global and governmental scale. Issues like carbon emissions and global warming is greatly discussed. They also discuss about the nation's GDP. However, there is little or no guidance on how you can use the concepts of environmental economics for your small and medium scale business. Therefore, very little of it is put in practice. Now, we present to you the environmental economics concepts that you can apply so that you can be sustainable. It is the benefit you get when you work along with nature. We also hope that you have a better view of environmental economics from our presentation. Thank you for watching. Hi everyone, good evening and good morning if you are from the, the other part of the uh, the other part of the world. Um, anyway, welcome um, everyone to for today's topic um, about environmental economy for ecotourism operators and scuba diving educator. Um, our speaker today is none other than um, well, I can say well, well known and everyone um, idol. Every he's a living legend, um, Sir Anwar Abdullah. So anyway, today my, uh, I will be your moderator. My name is Monica Chin. I'm from North Borneo, Sabah, and I'm uh, one of the Ocean Quest Global Trainer. And I'm also one of the um, Ocean Quest Global Ambassador in Borneo. So once again, I welcome everyone for the session today. Okay, so let me introduce a little bit about our speaker today. I'm sure all of you can't wait to hear from him. His experience are tremendously valuable for all of us. And we, not really, we, we can't really have him all the time here via Zoom and everyone can watch from all over the world. Okay, he is the founder of Ocean Quest Global, and with his uh, over 40 years experience on coral reef rehabilitation, um, experience in coral and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, about the ocean, and also ADEX Asia Dive Expo, the longest uh, scuba dive expo served in Asia, as an uh, ambassador since 2019. So, all right, I'm sure um, everyone can't wait to hear from him and hear what he is sharing with us today. And I stop talking now. Okay, right. um, uh, Sir Anwar, the floor over to you. Thank you so okay. much. Okay. Right. Uh, first of all, I like to welcome everybody to this webinar. And uh, thank you, Monica, for introducing. And uh, I think she has already described who I am. 
So I can proceed to the topic that we are going to talk about today. The topic that we are going to talk about today is environmental economics for ecotourism operators and scuba diving educators. Right, before I begin the part of my presentation, let's uh, look into the overview of this thing. The first thing is when we talk about economy, people will look it in the broad uh, perspective, which is the global or governmental or national size of economy. They will talk about the GDP, they will talk about the um, carbon uh, emissions and all this environmental economics. And there is a thing that the trade or the factories or the industry is using now is called cap and trade. We're not talking about those. We are talking about the economy, the environmental economy that is applicable to the small businesses and the medium businesses that is on site. Because so far there is no guidance whatsoever. I've been searching online to see if anybody is speaking about it. Uh, I did not find any so far, right? So um, how do we apply environmental economics in the smaller scale so that when more and more people practice it, then only whatever the environmental economic campaign globally, for example, by United Nations, by your country, by your community will work. Because on the ground, people are not working in that way. They, this is why the environmental degradation is always against economy. So let's uh, clear this up, uh, what environmental economics is to ecotourism. Before I start, I also like to say thank you to LifeWorks, who is the host of this Zoom uh, platform, and Ocean Quest Global, which is my organization. The topic area that we are going to talk about is, the first is the fundamentals of economics. I will cover this briefly, just about a couple of minutes on environmental, fundamental of economics, because not everybody in my audience uh, uh, converse with what economics is all about. And so if uh, I need to cover this fundamental so that they are on the same page when we are talking about the rest of the presentation. The second topic about uh, in this uh, webinar is values of the ecosystem services. Before I start, we already run a video uh, which uh, shows you the value of the ecosystem, but I will cover a little bit more in detail on this part. Then once we understand the values of the ecosystem, we will then see the ways that we can incorporate it into a business model, right? We don't have to be a government or an international body to be able to incorporate environmental economics in our business model. We will learn about this. Then the fourth topic, the final one, is how harnessing the power of environmental economics in ecotourism business that will be able to benefit the industry in the long run. I mean, how the industry can sustain in the long run. And that the local community can also sustain without any catastrophic impact to them in the long run, okay? So first is the fundamental of economics. The fundamental of economics uh, always uh, revolve within the law of supply and demand. 
when we see the supply and demand, the uh, X and Y uh, planes are drawn up here. In the Y plane is the price and the X plane is the capacity of the service. In industry, they will say the products, right? Uh, so we call it capacity of service because what I'm talking about are people who are providing service and how much they price their services, okay? So the first curve we look in here is the supply curve that is going up. And the second curve is the demand curve, which is going the opposite direction. Now, for example, we blindly put a price of something. Uh, say a snorkeling tour uh, for one morning for three hours. So we price it at $45. So when we price it at $45, we are geared to provide service to almost about where it meet here is about 30 people. This is our capacity. And then the demand will be high because it is cheap. A lot of people wants the service. A lot of people wants to go and participate. And therefore the demand is much higher than what I can supply. That means there's a shortage of services. This is the model where people do in most of the places in Southeast Asia. By creating this vacuum, it opens up for mass tourism, which is not healthy. We'll talk about this later. But then looking at the shortage, I wanted, for example, to build my business up and equip my business to handle for 80 people, for example. And then I start to invest in equipment In I put my resources. When I put my resources in, see the demand, the demand curve starts to meet at the point of 25. So only 25 people is gonna buy my product at this price, but I have invested for that many. That means I have a lot of surplus. That means I have over invested and I have a lot of surplus. Ideally, when we do the services, we will want to meet at the point where the supply meets the demand, which is what we call the equilibrium. So that is the law of supply and demand. So that briefly explain what it is. And we will come back to this later on, okay? To have this going on, we will use, when we invested, we invested in the energy and we invested in the resources to make production consumption cycle to start to roll, right? But we don't realize there's another element that is contributing to this is the ecosystem services. This is the services that nature provides to us for free. A beautiful mangrove, a pristine coral reef, a scenic, um, uh, viewpoint. So all this are uh, ecology. We don't buy them, we don't acquire them. It is readily available and we make use of it for free. This is the ecosystem services that is coming together with the energy we put in and resources to make the production consumption cycle going. And when it goes, it has an output the output in terms of impact to the environment, waste, pollution, and all this. What happened when it starts to grow? When the production consumption starts to grow, the resources start to shrink, the energy starts to shrink, the quality of the environment starts to shrink, and the impact becoming greater and greater. This is where it becomes unsustainable, right? So it doesn't show in a year. It doesn't show in a couple of years. It shows in 10, 15, 20 years. So 10, 
15, 20 years down the line, most of the businesses will not only have reached the plateau, they have reached the plateau of maximum capacity for a long time already. They are starting to degrade now because less and less people coming to them because their ecosystem no longer is as beautiful or the animals that use, they used to show people is scarce and hard to find it. Things like that, right? So it become unsustainable. So what happened with ecosystem services? The things that we see just now, the kayaking in the a, in a, in a, uh, mangrove forest, the diving with the whale shark and the snorkeling with the manta rays, or even in the savannah looking at lions, whatever, right? How much is this asset cost? How much is the value of this asset, this environment that we have never paid a cent to, right? If you look at the world economy, the value of the world economy is at $75 trillion. That even is not even a scratch on the surface if you compare to the value of the ecosystem. It is simply immeasurable, right? That is why when it gets damaged, it is so hard to, to rehabilitate or repair because it simply says that, I'm simply saying that whatever the $75 trillion you have, you can't buy the world. No matter who you are, no matter how, what a billionaire you are and you have spaceship going to outer space these days, we are, we are talking about the, 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 the powerful few who's going to space. They can't buy the world, right? They can't buy the world. They cannot afford to buy the world. Their money cannot buy this. And therefore, their money even put together, everyone, the powerful and the rich, everyone put together, they cannot fix the ecosystem if it's degraded, right? So this is my message. Let's look at how we can sustain ourselves and keep the ecosystem going so that we don't have to have to fix it. Now, we go back to the production consumption cycle. With the energy we put in, the ecosystem services that we are using and the resource we put in, within the business, with, during the process of production consumption cycle, if we contribute back a little bit, how much? I will, I will elaborate on this shortly. We will be able to bring sustainability, meaning when we start to put back from this cycle, we, we contribute back into the input, there will be a balance. That means the impact, the input and the output will be more or less manageable. And that is what we call sustainability, right? So how do we do that? How do we take this example and put it in dollars and cents in say a snorkeling business that we are talking about earlier, right? So sustainable business model. First, we need to realize that the environment is not limitless. It has a capacity. So we have to establish a carrying capacity and its threshold. Meaning that if we have a field uh, that we are going to put so many cattle to, to graze on the grass in that field, we start to add more and more and more cattle on that field until the land could not support the consumption of this cattle. And that's the threshold, right? So that means we have to reduce the number of cattle on that piece of land to let the field be able to replenish. Then we are going to have a sustainable output of that 
thing, the, 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 the farming. So when we apply to ecotourism business, every day we go, for example, we walk, we start opening up a track in a little forest, right? We walk past the same path. First day, the second day, a week later, two weeks later, we will start to see the vegetation along this path are dying and a clear track can be seen and followed by anybody now because it is so clear. So we have created a line where we have impact the environment, what we call the trail, right? So we already start damaging the environment from there. And then we start to bring people, more and more people. And these people, there will be waste, there will be pollution, there will be a lot of things that is going on, right? And then that is not the only thing that is the carrying capacity is going to concern. Remember when we put the price low, there's a big demand, a lot of people will come and my shop seems to be endless of people. What do I attract? I attract local interest to one, to, to have seen the lucrative business of mine and want to have their own business like mine without knowing anything about environmental economics or whatnot. I have triggered a need in that market so that more and more people who are not knowledgeable wanting to get in this business. So initiated by me, the single business, in 10 years, we have a hundred business. And if my threshold was only hundred people, a hundred business, they are not going to take one person a day, they're going to take a hundred people a day. And therefore, inadvertently, by showing a lucrative business in this also makes the environment degrade because we are going to bring a lot of people into this industry, they call it. Actually, it's not an industry, it's a, it's a one-way ticket. In Malaysia, in Thailand, in Indonesia, the most common you will see is the local communities that awakened by this lucrative business. They saw this lucrative business and they will start to see, I can do that too. I have plenty of land. I'm gonna sell 50% or 60% or 80% of my land. I'll get millions of dollars. I can do better than him. I can do better than Anwar. I can do better than Monica. This is the concept that we have to be very careful with because without knowledge, these persons in the local community, we have seen so many that gone bankruptcy within a few years after selling so much land, after buying so much things, after investing so much and have no knowledge of business and have no knowledge of environmental economics, they end up selling the business to out, um, outsiders, right? This is true for every island in Southeast Asia, I can say. Every island have at least one of this type of business, right? So they can quickly bring the numbers up, we call mass tourism. They bring the numbers up that the environment are not be able to cope. Inadvertently, they also damage their own business because the environment degrade, people will no longer come here, they get less scars and scars, and they start to have conflict between businesses and all these unhealthy things that is going on. This is why carrying capacity and its threshold need to be understood by all the stakeholders within the industry, right? The carrying capacity is not unlimited. And therefore, the only way to go up when they are reaching the threshold is to put the price higher. It's not by putting more people in, 
right? Volume business does not help the environment. Second, consider the environment as an asset and it's depreciable. This is the best way. Consider it as you have the stewardship and ownership of this and you are responsible to care for it. Yes, it is free. The first time you touch the ground here on this island, you go snorkeling there. You saw it was so beautiful and you love it. Immediately, it becomes yours because nobody owns it. Immediately, it becomes yours and you start a business and you don't realize that it is your asset that is going to degrade over time. Then you are bound to lose over a few years of time. The environment will degrade, less people coming diving with you, less people come snorkeling with you, less people come trekking with you. And then as the environment goes, the environment will also drag you along with it, drag your business along with it, right? Second, the third part is to reinvest in conservation. This is the part I will, I will elaborate a lot late, uh, in, in the next slides. When I say reinvest, invest in conservation, a lot of people will jump up the chair and say, Anwar, I am only a small business. I take five people a day to snorkel and then I, I don't earn enough to, to contribute to conservation, to do any kind of conservation. Wait till I tell you how. When you want to invest in conservation, I'm not telling you that that resources has to take from your pocket, okay? I'm not asking you to do that. You have to understand that when you invest in scuba equipment, in kayaks, for example, in snorkeling gear, mass and snorkel and fins, in wetsuits and everything, you invest in it. But you don't realize that you can also invest in conservation, but from not from your resources. I will explain how shortly. Commit to sustainable practices. Yes, a lot of this is common among a lot of uh, uh, dive shops nowadays where they provide like uh, water dispenser so that to encourage people to refill instead of taking plastic bottles and so forth, right? So a lot of people, this is a good thing. This is a sign. A lot of people are coming into sustainable practices, reuse, and they also organize the thing that don't cost them much money, like cleanups, for example. So they, they commit to sustainable practices, right? This is a good practice. So let's now move on to how we are going to do the thing. In a case study, there are many small businesses in Thailand that I, I personally do. And these people are affiliated, mainly affiliated to Ocean Quest Global. Yeah, I'm taking example from them as a case study. When they do the environmental economics within their organization and they are setting aside a little bit for conservation. They are able to equip the facility for the sustainable concept without coming from the main resources. They can avoid straining the financials for purpose of conservation. Provide their employees with environmental education I've trained so many dive masters, local dive masters, to become ocean quest trainer to propagate coral. And it is provided by the employer, right? That shows that those who invested in environmental economics are able to do this. And then they make time and space for conservation. They are able to do this as well, okay? How? Now, let's go back to the supply and demand chart. So 
Look at it this way. Say I'm a small business. I take about 30, 40 people a day. Or we use the same equilibrium here. Say uh, this equilibrium is about 50 people a day, twice a day, 25 in the morning, 25 in the afternoon, right? So 50 is my capacity. But now I make allowances in my price for ecosystem services. You see on the left, lower left corner here, I have started the line from here, from uh, 20, and then now I start the line at 30. That means I increase actually just $5 in here. If you look at it again, yeah, my main price is 60. I jack up allowance one notch up for environmental allowance. I only increase to $65, okay? When I increase by $65, that's $5 that's going into the pot for ecosystem services. And that's 25 times five in the morning, 25 times five in the afternoon. And I will challenge anyone to say they are not capable within the first month to start investing, right? So if you have full capacity, say you have half capacity, you have 25 a day, 25 times five, right? That's a lot of money a day into this pot, right? And in, in 30 days, you can already start investing in a new water dispenser, a things like that, that comes directly from just pushing your price one notch up and making allowance for it. And this does not take from your pocket. It comes from your customer. It comes directly from your customer. And you must maintain a discipline to set this amount aside. That's all. And within a year, you, it's imaginable. Within a year, it's imaginable already. Just for $5, folks, this is environmental economics. When you push it up one notch and include environment in your, in your resource, your energy, and then you put ecosystem services fee, which is only $5 in a year, in one season of eight months, for example, if you don't work a year, you have so much surplus money for conservation. You don't need to apply for a government grant for conservation. You don't need to wait for grants for United Nations, which is you are going to compete with millions of other people who wanted the same fund from the same pool, right? You're not competing. You basically uh, making your own funding right here. That's environmental economics in a business model. This is what I'm talking about. And please wake up and see how big it can be from how small a contribution, right? So key advantage, when you do that, you put one notch up in your business model or your supply and demand model you suddenly become self-sustaining. You don't need any NGO to come and support you. You don't need, uh, you don't need the, the government to come to you and say, if you do this, we will give you a certain amount of funds which, we, which they will never show up uh, most of the time because they promise the same to a trillion other people, right? So you be, suddenly become self-sustaining. And then the best part is when any need for environmental action comes, you don't have to delay. You have money in hand, you can do your direct action directly, right at the spot. You don't have to beg for people to donate, throw your hats around, beg people to come and help you. When there's environment catastrophe, 
You need a hundred people to help you. You need to serve lunch. You need to serve breakfast. There's enough money for several days, in fact, to do it, right? Without delay. Then reserve funds for environmental action. If there is nothing going on, you always have the reserve and your reserve is growing. This reserve, if you declare it as environmental funds and you use it as environmental fund, it's non-taxable. You have to write to the tax department and say, this is the fund, this is the amount that I allocate for this and this money is for this fund. You can say environmental and humanitarian even, or charitable funds. It does not hurt you in any way with having this reserve, right? And then allowance for expansion and improvement. Okay, now your shop has the water dispenser, your shop has all the uh, uh, different color rubbish bins so that you can sort things out. You have, um, you have solar panels that runs your fan during the day. You have money to buy them to, to get things so that you don't use power from the grid, which is taking from a coal uh, power plant. You have a solar panel. You have a lot of things. You can expand. You can be energy efficient. You can be uh, carbon efficient. You can be pollutant efficient. You, you, you can manage your pollutants. Well, a lot of expansion can go on. These are the key advantage. And then if nothing happens at all, suddenly COVID-19 came, a lot of these people are suffering today because they have no reserve. When contingency comes, imagine you, you are 10 years down the line in your business. How much reserve for contingency do you have if you have set aside that one notch of $5 per customer, per service. How much do you think it will be? You can easily pull through three years of not working. I can guarantee you if you'd run it for 10 years, right? And your business will not go, go down the drain, start selling scuba tanks and scuba regulators and all this, right? So these are the key advantage. This is economy in a smaller scale, but effective, okay? Now I am open for 10 minutes for Q&A, so I'm gonna stop sharing. If there's anybody who have a question, uh, Monica, do anybody have uh, in the chat says anything? I yeah, anything? yeah. thank you so much, Anwar, for the, for the first, uh, first part of the session. Okay, so if any one of you out there, you have any question, uh, if you are attendees, or you can also type in the chat group, and I will read it out and get uh, Anwar to answer your question. So do feel free to drop your question in the chat box. Okay, since there's no question, I will then continue my presentation. Yeah, uh, somebody say, can you share the recording uh, that with us, of course. Uh, yeah, it's recorded. Melanie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will, I will share with everybody. Yeah. In fact, it will be on YouTube even if uh, possible. Yeah. So, let's continue the talk. It's interesting, right? I stopped. Yeah, very interesting. <laughs> because everybody seems silent. Uh, what do I do? I inject a valium on everybody or what? Yes, yes. It's, 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 <laughs> okay. it's so, so informative. So please keep on sharing. Okay. Let's go to the uh, summary. We have learned about the fundamentals of economics, the uh, supply and demand uh, and how it works. And we have understand the value of the ecosystem services, right? Basically, the price is immeasurable. And folks, if you follow a system that allows for environmental economics in your business model as a dive shop, as a snorkeling shop, as a trekking, uh, jungle trekking tour operator, 
or as a travel agent or a hotelier or a resort, you will be well off and it doesn't hurt. You, the money in your pocket is the money in your pocket. Don't consider that when people talk about environmental economics, you are going to have to come up with money in your pocket. I'm not saying that. Anwar have lived for 40 years in this line. Anwar have never asked any of the business owner for money. Do I? Any? None, right? So how to use environmental economics in your business? I just show it just now, how to do it, right? That is just the price part. There are a lot more details. If you want to learn about environmental economics, there are a lot more things to, to know within the production and consumption cycle, the processes, how do you uh, use even environmental economics within your marketing strategy, all these things that then snowball within that production consumption cycle and give back into your business. And therefore your resources is stabilized and not quickly depleting. The environmental situation is much more protected if all the stakeholders, I'm not talking about one person here, if all the stakeholders consider, hey, we have 80 dive shops here in Kotao, that's too many. Our environmental uh, environment is breaking apart. Oh, uh, who cares? That's the situation it happens, right? Then, oh, let's throw some broken cars and broken motorcycle to solve the problem. You can't solve the problem that way, folks. You have to solve a problem logically and economically, right? When you are economically strong, Imagine 80 dive shops in one island and they are all strong economically to support the environment. They can finance a faculty in a university to do research for them. Imagine that, but they have never done that. Instead, they've thrown all the garbage in the ocean in the name of conservation. That is, that is wrong, right? So this is example, yeah? This is an example. So this is the summary. Now, opportunities. You, there are many opportunities. When you are following us, uh, there are many opportunities for future webinars. We are not uh, stopping just here. Uh, the next webinar will come, I think, around 7th of September. And that was a different topic. I will announce the topic uh, shortly after this webinar. You can sign up for our online courses. There's so many courses coming up soon. The development of our online courses is, uh, we are busy doing it right now. And by October, there are a few courses coming up, not just the coral propagation courses. We are uh, also introduct introducing the field training instructor course for those who want to work with communities, for example, to be a community trainer. Uh, we will introduce that course as well. Or you can volunteer with us. You can also join our field training programs. Yeah, come and join us. For example, when we visit our partners in Gili Travangan, for example, and come look at the coral nursery, look at what they do for waste management, look at the, the interesting they do, right? And then if we go to other places, for example, in Borneo, and then we meet Monica and see what Monica is doing, right? Things like that, join our field training programs. Become Ocean Quest field training instructor. We welcome anybody who wants to be an instructor and teach the local communities during uh, community engagement. Uh, this is the next one is participate in our community engagement program. If you participated in it also can, but if you want to go further, you can be a field trainer. Be our corporate partner. 
we, there are a few corporations that are working with us right now. They are taking courses with us. They want to do their coral propagation, coral rehabilitation program in a four-year program. They are doing, so that means when we are partnership with them, what we provide is we provide a technology transfer from us to them. We teach them everything we know so that after that four year period, we will shake their hand and say, good luck, take stewardship of this, take stewardship of this project and continue. This is how we work. Be our corporate partner and it is endless basically. Yeah. So during that time that you are handling your own after the period of partnership is over and you encounter problems, the unique consultancy, Ocean Quest door is always open, it's free. Yeah, this is how we work. And then at the bottom, this is our contact if you need to know more about us. All right, Anwar, we have a comment here from our audience. Yeah. From Mark Rahman is yeah. uh, probably we you can share a little bit about your experience or what is your advice on this. So the question is: It is tough to control the numbers of operators in one area. Unfortunately, the more operators in one area, price will be thrown, and only high volume tourists will be profitable. The solution is, is also limit, limiting max operator in one area. Yeah. So what, what, what is your... What yeah, is your... Um, I, I totally agree because what he's saying here is that the, the entire Southeast Asia is engrossed with the idea of mass tourism, right? Because the people up there and the people down here have no knowledge whatsoever about environmental economics, right? And they probably, this is the first time they heard it, right? So then they should know about this. They should know that the number of stakeholders in the local community and then the other stakeholders, and if there is an expansion going on, if there's a new business going on that is going to come into a certain area, there must be a certain regulation, right? If the top people of each country says, oh, we are going to embrace sustainability. Yeah, you tell me, what sustainability are you going to embrace if mass tourism is continued, right? Because why we are talking about environmental economic now? Because this is the perfect time that we have to talk. Because when we restart and you try to restart back what you have practiced long ago, if this ever happened again, you don't have a chance. Humanity will be in trouble in the next one, right? If we don't embrace environmental economics, environmental, if we don't address environmental issues, then consider COVID-19 is just a precursor of what you're gonna face in the future, right? By knowing, like Mark is saying, we have to limit the maximum operators. This is what the city planners should do. This is what the Commerce uh, Association should decide. This is all the policymakers should get in, all the stakeholders to come in, in the realization of the importance of environmental economics. Because if everything goes down the drain, the country that is the most remote will have the whole economy in the end because that is the last frontier, they call it, right? The, all this area within Southeast Asia, the Borneo, the Celibacy, the, 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 the Western Pacific side, yeah, you don't stand a chance, okay? Uh, the amount of degradation that is going on, 
with species extinction, for example, sharks, turtles, mantas, uh, seahorses, right? You name it, down to the very sea cucumber is taken right now, right? So you tell me where we're heading if we don't embrace the environmental economics of things, right? When we talk about, we just talk about the, the tourism side. We have not talked about harvesting the sea, right? How much you can fish and how much you can't fish. Where you should close, where should open and these places. You name one marine national park in this region that actually imposed this. None. None. Okay? So we have to come to the realization that this is educational and this needs to be listened to. Right. Thank you, Mark, for the comment. Yeah. I, yeah, I see so that the Q&A admin, is there a standard by OQ for island environment accounting? Uh, well, we don't set a standard for islands. We set standard for ourselves. Right, so what we can practice and what we cannot practice. That is the thing that we do. We benchmark ourselves, but we don't benchmark others. Right? Yeah. The, the thing about policies, about islands and areas and geographical areas and geographical location, we are not the government. We can't do that, right? Right, so, one more question here from C. Peng. Yeah. Is there any governing agencies or research agency that provides information on carrying capacity of protected area like marine park or hutan simpanan? Uh, yeah. Can you can answer this, Anwar. Yeah, this, uh, this is a very... We have a discussion many years back about carrying capacity. Uh, in fact, there's one topic was talk, uh, spoken during the the change of government recently, right? So to know about carrying capacity, like I do the example of the cattle and the grazing ground, right? That's easy because the grazing ground and the number of cattle, right? But when it comes to hum human being, the variable is indefinite, right? They are damaged by pollution by people. They are damaged by poaching by people. They are damaged by mass tourism by people. They are damaged by harvesting by people. There, there are so many things. In fact, the human hands is the most poisonous thing on earth. Everything we touch is gonna die, right? So uh, to study the carrying capacity needs time. We're not talking about a, a three-year diploma kind of thing, research, or three-year master's, two-year master's degree kind of research. That is, this is inefficient and insufficient, right? We are talking about a span of 10, 15 years to be able to see the impact, right? So who are willing to invest in this? If we businesses don't start putting aside money you think that the United Nations or the countries of the world is going to give grants for rehabilitation of environment? Think again. Prior to the pandemic, there's only already not enough money for humanitarian and environmental things, right? they can only give about 60% of what is needed. That is why a lot of places still go in hunger. A lot of camps is ill-equipped, like humanitarian camp is still ill-equipped. Medicine is not enough for victim of war and all this, right? So before the pandemic is already a shortage. What makes you think that after the pandemic that governments and the government of the world and will actually provide enough for this. Think carefully. 
unless the businesses will start to change. Oh, okay, I have to incorporate certain things. Today I sell $5, tomorrow I sell $7.50, right? And that $2.50 goes in this little pot and that pot is safe for environmental, right? Is it coming from my pocket? Absolutely not. It comes straight from the business and it goes straight into that pot. As long as you have the discipline to manage it, right? That will continue to grow every day of your business. Imagine after 10 years, what it would like to be. And you can simply just say, I'm going to see this doctor so-and-so of this faculty of coral reef. I want him to come and research. I will pay for his accommodation. I will pay for his students to come and do research. I will pay for his equipment even, right? That is what your capacity can be, but nobody does it. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, it was immersive. I yeah, feel... from Sipeng, that's uh, a question from Sipeng. So I think we should, um, yeah. it's almost, uh, almost time up here. I yeah. think uh, Anwar, we should take one more last question from Dina. Yeah. We are already in trouble as the ocean resources are being exploited and destroyed. So would you recommend a state regulator, a regulatory body to implement compulsory environmental economics practices um, for businesses? Look, there is, a, there is a, a, a thing, a law, uh, they call the Kuznet law in economics, right? This is regarding when a, a country gets richer and richer, they will be uh, more able to handle the environmental things, right? So a lot of countries are developing countries. They are not really a well-developed countries yet. So they are thinking, it's the same way as the small business thinking just now. Hey, Anwar, I don't, don't have any money to give for conservation. The same way, right? Most developed nations think that way because they are underdeveloped. They want funds from the international community to be able to put in into this. They did not consider this, right? For us as a body, for NGO, if we are called into a meeting, for example, to brainstorm about a policy, maybe we can recommend, right? But for us to go up the office and propose it to them, I'm not going there because I know the results. When you go and see these powerful people with a even your message is powerful and useful, it's unlikely that they can do anything anyway, right? So the best thing to do is when community gets together, when all the stakeholder gets together with the power of the collective voice, we can make a demand, right? We can make a demand to change certain policies Right? So if you have 50 businesses already in, say, Tawau doing the same thing, right? And you know that it's reaching the threshold already, or maybe over the threshold already, you don't want any more new businesses coming in, right? I don't encourage people to monopolize, but if the environment threshold is already there, is going to destroy, why do we need more businesses there, right? They can go somewhere else that is not affected. That's the key, okay? Thank you. Uh, okay, everyone, thank you so much, Anwar. Thank you, or uh, hopefully uh, uh, your answer is, uh, your question being answered, Tina. So I think we are at the end of the session today. This session is recorded. So um, yeah, Anwar, actually I heard a lot of people talking about uh, quality tourism, quality diving already um, mm. in, in the conservation, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the conversation nowadays. And 
hopefully um, the session today will be benefit and will be more uh, will be very useful for everyone out there who are listening uh, today and you can watch this session in our um, Anua or Ocean Quest YouTube any moment soon so that's all from me uh, thank you so much Anua for your time again today and we look forward for the next session um, uh, I step 7 September is it 7 September. Yeah, okay. I will, so I will announce the topic. Thank okay, you. Okay, so stay tuned, guys.